but I won the world championship. I was the best athlete in the world. Um, it was radical and awesome. And it was another one of those moments where I just woke up and was like, what just happened? What up, fam? Welcome to another episode of Life Beyond the Game. I have a really special guest for you all today. His name is Trey Hardy, and he is former, arguably the best athlete in the world. He competed in track and field in what's known as the decathlon, which uh, since the beginning of time, people have been competing in since the ancient Greeks. Uh, there's 10 events and uh, it's a display of, of pure athleticism. And Trey has an incredible story, literally speaking to one of the best athletes in the world. It was a true pleasure to have him on. He opened his heart and he shared vulnerably about uh, his transition and the difficulties that he's faced very recently in, in coming out of a, a pretty dark night of the soul that most athletes uh, face uh, when they're done playing. Uh, his athletic career is just filled with a wide variety of accolades. Uh, he moved up the ranks in college after he started competing in the decathlon and ended up making the 2008 U.S. Olympic team. And he was seven, I think seven events in, uh, really close, about to medal, and ended up getting a no height in the pole vault, which is one of his best events. Uh, no height means that he uh, missed and didn't score, which dropped him out of medal contention and uh, was a huge, huge uh, just failure in his life. And he talks about the intensity of that moment. Uh, a year later, he comes back and wins in the world championship and uh, ends up really crushing the next few years as one of the best decathlon uh, athletes in the world. Uh, he gets another opportunity to uh, really shift that story around. The thing with Olympic, uh, the Olympics is crazy. It's only only four times or one time every four years to compete. And I can't imagine the amount of pressure uh, that goes into competing at that level on the world stage. Uh, and he talks about the growth that he experienced. Uh, he ended up blowing his elbow out like worse than the Tommy John surgery, like a year before uh, the 2012 Olympic trials, he barely makes the team and he ends up going on and redeeming himself four years later, winning a silver medal with a uh, restructured uh, elbow on his throwing arm. It's really a truly incredible story. And that's just his athletic career. We dive into his transition and the challenges he's faced and some of the unlikely uh, tools that have helped him really find peace and purpose outside of sports. Uh, this is one of my favorite episodes I've recorded. Uh, Trey is really an incredible guy, and uh, I know you're going to enjoy it. So without further ado, enjoy this episode with Trey Hardy. But before we get started, I want to mention a new community I'm launching. I've been really passionately pursuing different ways that I can have an impact in the world. And one of the things that I've really come to honor, respect, appreciate and desire to cultivate more of in my life is community. And over the last few years, I've surrounded myself with incredible high impact leaders and entrepreneurs and influential visionaries, individuals who not only have the ability to facilitate impact in their lives and in their businesses and in the, the visions that they're leading, but they have the desire to support one another and really facilitating collective change as we move through this, this, this massive paradigm shift on this planet right now. Things are moving quick. Things are changing fast. Uh, the social, financial, ecological, all these systems are being called to change. And one way that I feel called to help facilitate this change is by bringing together really influential, high-impact, heart-centered change makers, those who are really passionately pursuing the opportunity to build a more beautiful world by integrating the energy of their hearts into their leadership, into their businesses, into their visions. This is more than just an entrepreneurial club. It's, it's, it's more than just a mastermind. It's more than just a community. And it's more than just an, an experience to focus on personal transformation. It's all of those things plus 
an opportunity to use our collective impact, energy, influence as leaders, as entrepreneurs, as visionaries to facilitate real change in the world, real positive impact, and be a part of the conversation so that we can really start integrating and building these new systems and integrating them into our businesses, into our visions, and supporting each other in that process. I'm calling in 40 of the most badass individuals I know. We're getting a lot of applications coming in, a lot of dope humans being called forth. If you are somebody that feels this deep in your heart, like you're meant for something more, and you want to be a part of a community that's really focused on facilitating real change in the world by integrating the energy of our hearts into our businesses and our visions and being supported by a community of really high impact individuals who are already and focused on heart centered principles, check it out. Theheartcollective.com. It's H A R T, theheartcollective.com. It's a lot more information and you can apply now. There's a link in the show notes. Enjoy the show. Just really grateful to be, to be back with you, man. I know, man. How long has it been? I feel like it's been a, a year. A year. A little over, it's been like 13 months since May 14. Since we connected? Yeah, I just, I just remember what we were speaking about then and the stories we were telling and what I was getting ready, what I was building was, yeah, it's a, it's a whole wild and, and crazy full circle, but we're kind of in the same spot. <laughs> I'm in the same spot. I went all the way around the world and ended up uh, kind of sitting in the same spot. Across from me, uh-huh. having the conversation. Uh huh. Oh, that's beautiful. Heck yeah! It, I mean, it honestly is. It's one of those things that I, at least, was like present enough to be. Uh, you know, but sometimes barely grateful, and other times really full of of gratefulness um, for what was happening to me, and not like to me, but what I was kind of experiencing um, and going through, and to be here. Yeah, it, we'll get into it. Yeah, we will. Yeah, let's we'll get dive into in. it, man. Well, let's paint the picture of, 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 of who you are and, and, the, and the journey that you've been on as, you know, it's, it's not every day you, uh, you meet an uh, Olympic athlete, one of the best athletes in the world. You know, I, I would consider it like, I had these moments when I was playing football and we talked about this earlier where when you're around great athletes all the time, it's, it's really hard. You're comparing yourself to those athletes. And so I'm, I'm with the best athletes in the world as offensive line, but I'm like looking up to them like, holy cow, these guys. But it wasn't until I got done playing when I was able to reflect on, holy cow, I was one of the best in the world. But yeah. you, were at an, you were at another level, man. It's like, like that th you don't know you're tall. Like it's in those settings. You don't know you're tall until you go to the grocery store. You're like, <laughs> is that... Is, those people are like way shorter than Why normal Why is everybody people. small here? Am I in Hobbitville? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah um, especially being around offensive linemen for me. I was one of the small offensive linemen. So I was always around like yeah. big. And you're players. top half a percent of humans on the earth, but you were bottom 5% of offensive linemen and the offensive guys in the room. It yeah. just, yeah. And it, I think we, when we were talking about it, it is that thing that like you just discover a talent at an early age and then you move through that and you do your best. That's kind of it. You discover a talent, you do your best. And I think it happens in a lot of avenues where people discover a talent for numbers or music or, or they have a high emotional intelligence and they end up in the field of psychology or they're, you know, they're great auditors or accountants and you just, they just did their best at the thing that they found that they were good at. Nobody wants to be a great auditor. <laughs> I don't know. There's people that dig There's numbers. Those geeky people. I think the partners that own the auditing firms. I mean, you want to talk. Ernst and Young are probably doing okay. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But like the the, it's just that aspect. And I, I got caught in in this this love for sport. Found out I was good at it. Somebody was going to pay me to do it. I, I didn't grow up with like an Olympic dream. You know, I didn't. I, the '96 Olympics were amazing, but I was more interested in what was going on so, in soccer. Mm -hmm. um, what was the dream when you were younger, as far as athletes, go, athletics go? I wanted to play like I, college basketball. Playing for like the University of Florida would have been, I you I could have died if you had told me that would have happened. I probably would have traded the rest of my life for it when I was younger. Um, since way, way back. I loved Lon Kruger was a, the basketball coach when I was growing up. They went to the final four in 1994. Like I had the posters on the wall, went to the camps. Uh, then Billy Donovan was there. I just idolized all of those guys. And then Jason Williams was that little white uh, point guard and was like, I got a shot. Like we can do this. And then it all, I didn't have like a, 
you know, like an all-star work ethic. I was just one of those talented kids. I think sports came easy. Um, I picked things up really quickly and got to a really um, average level instantly. A couple practices and I would be pretty good at it. And that's where it, most of the stuff kind of stopped, except for basketball. I just really loved playing. Um, and that was the dream. That really was it. And I didn't really think about going to the Olympics until... 2004, you know, I, I had jokingly said to my mom, my senior year of high school, <clears throat> I was learning how to pole vault, but we didn't have a pole vault coach at my high school. So I would go to camps and I came back from a camp and I saw this guy pole vaulting. His name was Jeff Hartwig, uh, best American pole vaulter um, at the time. He was the American record holder. He never ended up winning a medal, but he was, I mean, all time guy. You saw him pole vaulting in person? In practice, yeah. So we're having the camp and he's having a practice session. And part of our camp experience is to watch a professional do it. And I came back and I was like, mom, I want to be a professional pole vaulter. And you got lucky enough to see one of the best in the world doing it? I want to wow. I want to do that. Mm. And she's like, oh, okay. Uh, we'll just get a good education and get a degree to fall back on. Mm. And then kind of went like, are there pole vault scholarships? What is, like, yeah. what is this? Um, it's interesting. That's the lens of a, of a parent. It's like, where can this thing take you away from here? So yeah. you can have a better life. Than and you? it wasn't negative. It wasn't yeah. like, okay. It was curiosity. It, it, yeah. My, my mom wasn't trying to be like, no, you can't, but it was very like, okay, <laughs> get good grades and we'll try to support you and your, your hobby. When did it shift to track and field? Cause uh, you, 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 you told me that you were trying to become basketball player. That was the dream in high school. And then you didn't, didn't make the basketball team. You got cut in high school, right? Yeah. I mean, I wasn't even trying out for the team. I, I, I was on the team and tryouts were over. We only had like two spots to pick up guys. Like varsity's kind of set. It's not like this big team tryout. Let's see who makes it. It's like, hey, two seniors graduated and let's see who we're going to fill the spots with. You know, mm -hmm. the JV team's moving up into varsity. The freshman team's moving into JV. And that was kind of it. And it was, we're a few days out of the first tournament of the year. Like we got our, I've got a uniform, you know, like the team set and he just, go, he just pulled me out right before practice and said, we don't need you this year. And so my initial, to show how far fetched this was, I was a junior and I, I was just, oh, that's embarrassing. And I, I was a starter. I wasn't. So why? To this day, we don't know. But really? my initial reaction was like, okay, I remember saying, if you need me on JV this year, coach, I, I'll do that. You, you know? just wanted to play the game. Yeah, yeah, I'll do that. And then he's like, no, 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 we don't need you at all. And he said, go be a pole vaulter or something. So and there was something in there, obviously, but you still don't know what it was. No. And there's no, like my parents met with them. There was no, there, my, it wasn't my attitude. It wasn't my work ethic. It wasn't my skill. It wasn't anything. And he couldn't really offer an explanation. And maybe he did to my parents and they tried to protect me by not telling me. Uh, but there was nothing there. And I, you know, I cried for days, didn't want to go to school. Like it was really, it was a traumatic experience and used it, you know, like kind of, glossing over all the little stuff that happened, but used it for incredible external motivation to go be a good pole vaulter, you know? Were you uh, pole vaulting at the same time simultaneously with the basketball thing? And, or was it something you... It off season. You were like, okay, so, basketball's over now. Yeah. And most guys ran track. We had a, a fun group of guys that ran track and mm -hmm. a couple guys did both play basketball and ran track. And I had just taken up pole vaulting the year before uh, for a month, you know, like my sophomore year. And it was fun and cool. Uh, but yeah, then from like December on my junior season, I did a full season of track and like pole vaulted. That, like, I was like, I'm only going to pole vault. And I'm going to be the best pole vaulter in school history. And the next seat, my senior year, I set the indoor state pole vault record, which wasn't very high. I mean, I grew up in Alabama, so it wasn't great, mm -hmm. but I still, I set the record it was just like this internally, like big middle finger to that guy and ended up getting somebody from Mississippi State saw me and was like, hey, you want to take a visit? I'm like, okay. Because until that point, I was like, I was going to walk on at Auburn, you know, like if they would take me. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was it. That was my, uh, ended up going to Mississippi State on a little book scholarship and kind of got, I got to school uh, my freshman year and they're like, hey, you're going to do the decathlon. And that was it. That was my intro to all that stuff. 
what did, what did you, re- how did you respond to, you're going to do the decathlon? Was it something that like, what? well, it can be great at this. Is this like a challenge? And what are the events? What is, yeah. <laughs> what is that? Uh, I, it, pole vault's the coolest, funnest thing to train for. Not very like aerobically intensive, you know, not very, it's not a lot of, there's not a lot of gut check moments, you know, mm. fitness is not an issue. And the decathlon is the hardest event in track and field. Take us through the decathlon just so people that don't know, what is it? It is the crucible of athletic performance, which where can I look to gain? It's the hardest thing in the world to do other than, I don't know, maybe back to back ultra marathons, but it is the ultimate test of athletic and human potential. It is the 100 meter dash, the long jump, the shot put, the high jump and the 400 meter dash all in one day. And you come back the next day and you do five more events. You do the 110 hurdles, the discus, the pole vault, the javelin, and then you finish with the 1500. Um, and all of those events are scored on a points table. It's not like how you finish relative to the field. It's your points and, and performances against a table. And then there's an aggregate score at the end of it. Sum it all up to determine who the best overall athlete is at that competition. Um, and it's addicting. It is. 10 chances to compete. Um, and it's actually really good preparation kind of for life because it's a masterclass in like compartmentalization of failures and successes and how to move on and how to, how to handle adversity and really how to play the long game. It's, there's no instant gratification in the decathlon. Uh, so it really is a, it was, I did I hated training for it. I trained for it for, you know, four or five months. Uh, my freshman season, hated it. Didn't know why I was, it was hard. I, and I barely, tra- all I did was pole vault. Like in high school, I just did pull-ups and walked on my hands and pole vaulted. That was training. And then now I was running and hurtling and jumping and lifting weights and throwing and like doing all this stuff that was just, and dying. Every workout, I was dying. And I hated it. And then I did one decathlon. And it was actually here in Austin, Texas at the Texas Relays. And I didn't do terrible. I think I got seventh or eighth place overall, scored over 7,000 points and was like, oh, I get it. This is so cool. This is really cool. And I think I can beat all these guys. So until you competed, you're like, why the fuck am I doing this? This is terrible. Yeah. I was like, hopefully I, I just pole vault high enough that I can just revert back. And I had, I was all SEC as a freshman indoors. I'd set a good personal best. I got seventh place. They didn't, I don't think they'd had anybody score in the pole vault in a decade. Like I was thinking like, oh, great. I did good enough there. I'm not going to have to, I'll just do this one decathlon, get it out of the way, and then I'll just be a pole vaulter. It'll be awesome. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it hooked me. What like was I, it about the, the experience that hooked you as opposed to like a normal pole vaulting event that you could really crush? I really, I made a lot of really good friends in track and field. And I think the thing that wasn't really apparent to me, but, uh, at the time, but I still felt it was the connection with my competitors and the connection with the suffering we were doing together and the respect that I had. Cause I knew everyone else had probably trained just as hard as I had. Um, and there were seniors, so they'd been doing it for years. And it was just this, like, I'm going to win this. And there's 10 chances for me to do really well. And I, I ended up, I ended up being really fast. Uh, I was still growing. I just started lifting weights. So I started getting stronger and there was this like, oh, I'm nowhere near my potential. Let me see how far this goes. I'm going to stick with this until it stops being fun. You know, like I'm going to do this until it, it sucks. Mm. And, so take us on that, that trajectory. Where did it lead you next? Ooh. So I kept like, In successive decathlons, I kept setting personal bests. Like early on in any endeavor, I mean, it's just just a hockey stick of of performance. And that felt just so fucking good. It felt really good. And it feels good to have people come behind you, pat you on the back going, wow, you're you're so good. And Mm -hmm. you're going to be really great at this. Like, keep it up. Um, And I was big fish, small pond. I was in Starkville, Mississippi. Um, I got third at the SEC championships, beat a couple of All-Americans. Um, and then showed up at the NCAA championships my, my freshman year, only two and a half months after doing my very first decathlon. And I got, I can't, I'm, I'm getting old now. I'm forgetting. I think I got fifth place at the NCAA championships. I scored points for my team. It just, di- it just didn't happen. Like fresh, it's hard to score as a freshman in a decathlon. Um, 
And I, I did that and was like, oh my gosh, I'm an all American. Like as a freshman. Yeah. And it was just this really cool thing. It happens a lot in other events, but the decathlon, it's an old man's event. It's hard to do. And, um, I hadn't been training for it. Like I, I was just still learning the events and was just like, okay, here we go. This is going to be really fun. Mm. And then the next season came back and now I knew what I was training for. I knew what I was working for. I knew why I was suffering. And when you, and when you grasp onto that, why you can really suffer a lot more and you suffer with intention and then you're smarter about your training. And, um, how do you, how would you describe that? Why was it? I want to, I want to be the best in the world. Was it at this point was the Olympic dream kind of starting to take shape? Didn't know. I was so far away from those scores, but I was like, I just want to win the NCAA championship. Mm. I want to win. I think I could be the best. You know, I know a couple guys just graduated. There's me and maybe one or three or four other guys. I mean, I was fifth. So there's four guys, two of them graduated. It's a race to the top here. Um, still was so very, very far away from, you know, after my freshman year, I'm still 1300 points away from what would be my personal best at the end. And I, it was just, I didn't know There's yourself. The chasm is, is very big between you where I was and that, but I just wanted to be the best in the NCAA and then came out and, you know, Mississippi state cut their men's indoor program to make room for women's cross country and scholarships and title nine stuff. How did that feel? I, I didn't mind it because there wasn't an indoor event for the decathlon. You know, there was pole vault, but it, there wasn't like an indoor thing yet. Uh, they would later add it. I think they had it. Actually, they added it that year, but it, I didn't know what I was missing. So mm -hmm. I was like, ah, whatever. No sweat. I'm going to be fresh as hell for outdoors. and I'm going to be ready and, to rock and roll. And um, it would have bugged me had I not left it anyways, but uh, came out and won the SEC championship the next year and got second place at, at the NCAAs and, and scored over 8,000 points. And I was one of the youngest Americans to ever score 8,000 points. I was 20. Yeah, I was it was just after my 20th birthday. And that was the like, I, can, I could be pretty good. I, I just started vibrating. This is like when the world stage kind of started taking recognition of like, oh, this is another level up. Had a meet with my coach and we, I, still have, I still have the document. The signed document, we wrote a contract that Trey's going to do these things in the decathlon. Um, and it was really inspiring. I remember it was right up, it was just on I-35 at the Hampton Inn. Like it was here because the NCAA championships were here. And this was the day after we wrote it down and all of it added up to like just under the collegiate record, you know, to be the best in collegiate history. And I was like, okay. And again, the why got harder, the why got stronger. And I started to remove that little sticking it to that basketball coach a little bit mm -hmm. out of my, out of my like motivation. I wasn't thinking about him anymore. And I, I was thinking about him during hard workouts, like, screw this guy. I'm going to, I can do this. I can, I'm going to do this. Screw that guy. It was like the little reserve tank deep down in there. That you yeah. I'm two access. years removed from that guy cutting the best athlete in NCAA from mm. a basketball team in a little tiny high school with a bunch of white kids. Like seriously. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> we, uh, uh, moved through that and I, I ended up going to the Olympic trials, uh, a couple of weeks later and I'm lining up against the current world champion, Tom Pappas the future Olympic silver and gold medalist, Brian Clay, and a host of other professional athletes, like professional decathletes, which I didn't really know was possible. Lining up against them, getting to compete and kind of like same way it was my freshman year, like, okay, I didn't perform very well here, but I could beat these guys. I, I think I can beat these guys. These are 28-year-old men, you know, 32-year-old men that I think I can hang with. I'm, I need to stick with this. And a week later, my coach at Mississippi State said he was leaving. The school wasn't really going hard and fast after another really good multi-event coach, you know, another decathlon specific guy. And so I asked to be released just to go talk. Like, I just want to go see what's out there. I'd like to talk to some other universities and set up a couple of things with University of Tennessee, uh, University of Florida and Texas. Took one visit to Texas. And that was it. Coach hit it off. Team hit it off. The city is amazing. And 
Were you getting recruited at this point? Were they like wooing you and like kind of trying to buy for you to come sign? No, it happened so late and I didn't get recruited much in high school. So I didn't know how, what the signs would be to be recruited. Um, but we had stuff teed up to, to go, but it, it all happened so, so late that no one had scholarships available. So no, oh shoot, I wish we had known about this earlier, Trey. Uh-huh. Um, but Texas had some stuff freeing up and Mississippi State was still going to keep me on a book scholarship, even though I was the highest point scorer like on the team. And so it felt kind of disrespectful and, and dishonest um, because of the promises they had made on recruiting visits and on scholarships and stuff. So took one visit to Texas and was like, hey, this is it. This is really it. Classes, after my visit here, classes started like nine days later. So flew home to Birmingham, drove to Starkville after I'd already signed a lease. I'd already moved into my new place in Starkville. Got my stuff, stayed the night in Birmingham and then me and my stepdad drove back out to Texas and we got here. Classes started in like three days and I wasn't even enrolled in school, but I was here. And this felt right from the day I got here. It just felt like this is where I like, where I needed to be. Um, it, the, the level of, of expectation stepped up quite a bit, which is what I needed. And the environment, the training facilities over there, like second to none, they're, it, you know, my, the head coach had a saying, like, if you don't leave Texas with a degree and a championship, then that's a tragedy, mm. you know, because you're going to get, you're going to get everything you're ever going to need to be successful. And that was kind of the challenge that I needed. And it was a lot different than what I had experienced so far. And so it, as soon as I stepped foot on campus uh, at UT, then it was that I'm, I'm going to win a national championship. I'm going to go to the Olympics. And that was kind of as far as it went though. Mm. Yeah. So take us to that first uh, Olympic. What, what year was it? The first year you went to the Olympics? 2008. 2008. And you were, you were in contention through the events and then something happened. Yeah. Take us through that experience of, of your first time being at the Olympics, like being on that world stage. Holy cow. This is it. This is what I've been working for. And mm-hmm. then the disappointment of, of not meddling. There, yeah, there's, there's a lot. I think it's teeing it off with just, I was mentally unprepared to be at that stage. It was a, it's a big stage. It's the biggest stage. You know, it's like, it's a, the, imagine being like a rookie quarterback and just getting, you don't play at all. You don't practice at all. Um, and then all of a sudden you're going to start in, in the Super Bowl. Yeah. Fuck, right. That's, that's insane. And you're just like, physically you're, you're okay but you're just mentally unprepared for the pressure in the moment. And so I was having a good experience. I had the second highest score in the world that season um, leading into it. First Olympic team, the same world champion that I had lined up next to uh, in 2004. I beat him at the Olympic trials um, and only lost to the eventual gold medalist uh, and was very confident. Things were going really, really well. Had a great first day. First five events are outstanding. I think I'm in second or third place. I have a good first event and I have a really just horrible talking like I threw like 35 feet short of what I had thrown previously in the discus that season. That's a lot. It's a lot of points. I mean, we're talking like 150, 200 points. So a huge slide down the scale. I'm a pole vaulter, pole vault to bread and butter. I'm going to make up some points here and b- could not process that enormous failure in front of the world. It felt like I'd let everybody down. I was feeling sorry for myself. I I just was caught in that moment. And then honestly, the next thing I know, the next memory I have is just kind of getting zapped back. You know, like I I was up on the astral plane and then boom, got slammed back down and I'm on the mat in Beijing. And I've just had my third miss at my opening height and I get zero points. So I go and I'm still in third overall place down to last place. Uh, there's no medal. There's no nothing. Even if I finish, maybe it's like I'm 25th, you know? Because like, if you, you got a zero on that. Zero. So you can't, I mean, you just can't do that. I'm expecting 900 and something points out of this and mm-hmm. I get zero. Wow. Um, and so I and you attribute that to the process of not being able to kind of wipe the awareness clean. Because that's what a lot of people don't get. What, what makes athletes so unique is their ability to handle failure 
like as an offensive lineman, if I gave up a sack, fumble, touchdown, which happened to me one time, it's like, holy shit, that was the worst play ever. But I can't let that affect the other 50 plays going or else mm-hmm. I'm not going to have a job. And so because it's your first time, it was just, you didn't, weren't able to process that in real time. What was that experience like? What were you holding on to? Were you just replaying it in your mind? Were you like, fuck, I just trying to overcompensate with these next things? What was that? If I take myself back there again, it, it, it really feels like, like Joe, do not think about pink elephants. Just don't, don't think about pink elephants. And that's the worst thing in the world you can do. It's don't know hype. Mm. Don't, you've come this far. Don't know height. Don't do it. Don't know height. Don't know height. Everybody's sacrificed for you to be here. Don't, don't do that. Your parents spent 15 grand getting plane tickets. Don't, don't know height. And it, it just inexperience and, and lack of, of knowing what to do in those moments and unpreparedness and, and no mental strategy to handle failure. And I didn't fail in the discus. I, I just threw shitty. So it just, it was those negative whispers creeping in. And then once they got hold of my headspace, I couldn't sh- quiet them down and I couldn't shut them out and was, had, didn't have the tools to do it either. Yeah. Did I, you have like any type of mindset training or meditation practice or awareness tools? They didn't teach you any of that. I was a 24 year old kid from Alabama. <laughs> I had nothing. Mm. Uh, I did after that, <laughs> for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because to me, it wasn't a physical thing that that did that to me. It was a mental thing. So I came back and got a, a team and and figured out how to get, kind of combat combat those situations. And like I was mentioned earlier, that's it. That's I mean, the decathlon in and of itself is just a master class of compartmentalization and emotional processing and how to put things in your back pocket and not deal with them later, but just treat them as they are, as these moments in time that are, are like things that are in the past are in the past and and being present is what's most important and allowing yourself time to grieve, process, assess, and take the next best step instead of like just holding on and, and, blaming others and feeling i think we talked we kind of talked about it just before we got started about the shame of what uh, like how shame can kind of take a hold of you you know and you're, you're putting all this undue pressure on yourself and um but i got i got really good at figuring out how to fail and not and just let it slide off my back and assessing it and processing it and learning from it when the time was right Mm, I think that's one of the most powerful tools I've learned. That's such an intangible that you can't really, you got to go through the fire to actually earn the ability to handle failure and handling all these micro failures. You like in football, you see these incredible receivers and quarterbacks making these insane plays. It's like, whoa, how do they do that? And it's because they've failed countless times to get to a point where they can make it look so effortless and easy. Take us through it. So you were on the world stage. You had this, like, don't, don't fuck this up. Don't fuck this up. Don't fuck this up. And then you fucked it up. I mean, it must have, I can, I can feel the energy of it right now. Just like the, it's the whole world, at least feeling like the whole world looking at you. How did that, how did that feel? And then how long did it take you to, you talked about grieving and feeling and just the intensity of emotions that must've been moving through you. How long did it take you? And what, what tools did you, did you seek out support? moving through that and how long did it take you to kind of get back on the horse and say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get back on this thing and, and try again. A uh, month, uh, came home, um, from the pole vault pit. I mean, I'm, I'm actually crying. I'm crying as if someone had done this to me because I, I just woke up, you know, and I'm looking for my coach and he is gone. Obviously upset. You know, like just can't believe this happened. We've come so far. I was going to win a medal. Um, we didn't know what color it wasn't going to be gold, but that's going to win something. And there was just this, like a big three week long come to Jesus moment about how serious I was going to take this. And it was like, are you, is this something you really want to do with your life? Cause if so, you got to take it more seriously and be a professional, you know, that's, a, that's a lot of conversation summed up into, into one and being professional to me meant 
basically getting my shit together and coming to this like a business in all facets. So talk to uh, USA track and field and the USOC have, we, we get access to sports psychologists and there's a couple of them that were in house in Chula Vista where kind of the track and field USOC headquarters kind of were where um, if I wanted to go train there, you know, I could stay in the dorms and have access to some of the physiotherapy and medical and some of the coaches down there. And they had a sports psychologist, um, uh, Dr. Reardon. And he was the first one that talked to me about just mental health and strategy and, and the strategy in sport. Um, what were some I, of the things, do you remember what he was, what he was like, because we're not really taught this stuff. This is kind of like some real. You learn, you go through the fire. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, I, I obviously need this because I experienced this. So how can I have, train my resilience in this? And, you know, I'm, I'm sensing like this, you were young and there's a sense of immaturity, maybe a little bit of a victim, like, holy shit, I can't believe this happened. Why me? Mm -hmm. As opposed to taking responsibility, because that's the hardest thing. And the, the, the biggest awakening anybody can really have is finally taking responsibility. So what were the things, were they, were they, pretty profound for you at the time or just like little tools to start training and implementing into your practice? I think, you know, a 24 year old cocky, arrogant, you know, I ended up breaking the collegiate record. And so at that time I'm an Olympian collegiate record holder. Shit don't stink. Yeah. Like, okay, let's see what you, let's see what you got old man. Mm. You know? Mm. Uh, so for me, they were so small and insignificant. These, these new tools, it's like, there's no, like, okay, I'm, I'm looking for the profound yeah. home run, like fireworks trays, like, oh yeah, I got this secret, this secret tool that no one else has. It was just rehearsal. It was just mental, mental practice mm. and accepting that my performances were entirely up to me. No one else can, can control my body and no one else can control my preparation. And I began the process. I didn't get really good at it till later that year of really rehearsing everything that could possibly go wrong or well. Um, you think about all these iterations, just talk about like a hundred meter dash. Okay. What if my shoe breaks in warm ups? Okay, I've got a backup shoe. Okay. What if it's raining? Right, I've got an extra top so I can warm up in this top and change tops. Uh, what if the guy to my right false starts? Okay. Okay. What if the guy to my left false starts? Okay. What if I false start? Okay. What if I get a bad start? Okay. I'm not going to panic. I'm going to, I can stay the course. I can eat up the back half. I'm going to be okay. And it's just one event. Okay. What are the differences in those times? A bad start might be 1060 for me. Good start might be 1041, 1038. What are the differences there in points? Oh my God. Okay. It's only like 15 points. 15 points is like, Nothing. That's just like a lean in the, in the 1500, you know, let's just, I can, okay. Well, what happens if I like, if I feel this, you know, thing in my knee that I've kind of been feeling last month, All right, We got a doctor there. We're going to do this, 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 and this. I'm going to prepare the next two weeks are going to be like this. So I did that for every single event. Oh, what if it's rain? What if it's raining? What if it's windy? What if it's, I think I already said raining, but like all those iterations and all of that those decision trees for every single event, every single attempt. And then you stack on like, well, what if I'm in like fourth place? What if I'm in last place? Okay. I need to get mentally prepared in the weeks leading up as I'm stepping in to do my last, you know, 1500 meter workout. It's a 1500 meter workout running for gold or running for bronze or, you know, and I know the names of the guys I'd probably be running against. It's all of these things to put myself in the situation so that when I got to the big moment, now I knew what the moment was going to feel like. Mm. No one feels good at the pole vault. I thought it was just me. No one feels good. It's, 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 oh, I'm glad I've, I'll never experience that again. But I know what that felt like. And so when I got to those moments at the world championships, the ne very next season in 2009, I, I was, I'd already done it. You know, I'd already, it was already rehearsed and I'd rehearsed victory. I'd rehearsed failure. I'd rehearsed all these things that, so when it was happening to me, I honestly was in a state of flow the entire two days. It was just, I was so in tune. Everything felt so fun and easy. And I didn't put a bunch of pressure on myself. I really want to highlight this because this is super powerful. Like playing out the worst case scenario in your mind 
And you can use this technique for anything because the way fear works is it creates like a lot of tension. Your nervous system gets activated and it's a lot of what ifs. And it's Mm -hmm. like, don't, the fear is like, don't look at me because I'm so scary. So then it just creates this story of like, oh man, like what's going to happen? It's unknown. But if you start filling in the unknowns of like, well, what's the worst that could happen? Like, what if my shoe, you know, pops off and it's like, okay, instead of it happening and be like, oh, what do I do? And like that initial, like, holy cow. It's like, oh, I just, I got, I got an extra pair of shoes. So that rehearsal of the worst case scenarios, a lot of people don't allow themselves to go into the worst case scenarios and actually feel what that might be like and realize, oh, it's, it's really not, not that bad. Is it, it, could it be worse? Well, let's, let's play that out. It's actually not that bad. And you start finding out like, okay, the worst case scenario is really not that bad. And really that, that, that response in those moments is really just a lack of control and wanting control. And mm-hmm. that rehearsal lets you take control before it ever even happens. It just, I knew this was going to happen. Mm. We got this. And so your confidence is just like at an all time high, just because of this rehearsal of these things. And like, not just thinking about what could happen, but like feeling it viscerally. And like, if this happens, how would it feel in my body Mm. so that you can understand your nervous system and be able to regulate it in those moments when they happen on the world stage? Yeah. And you, and this is a really good example. I think everybody knows like what Usain Bolt looked like before races. I mean, he was like dancing and like, he was having a good time and that wasn't, I don't think arrogance. It was really just mentally preparedness. He was ready to accept the outcome of the race. Um, and that's what, that's what kind of changed for me. That fear was completely gone. And I didn't, at the time I didn't know it was fear. I thought it was just like, I'm going to be really, you know, hard and confident and I'm the, I'm the man. And then it totally pivoted for me where I'm like high-fiving guys before races, like, Hey, dude, good luck. We're going to do this, right? Let's go. And then, and then we're doing that and people are looking at me like, what's this guy doing? This is really weird. Uh, but it was just taking control of the situation and accepting whatever was going to happen because I'd already figured out the outcomes. Like I'd already done it all. And so in those moments, there's this calm, openness, um, like joy, real, actual joy joy. And that aperture is just so big and wide. It's not this like weird focus that you're not paying attention to the weather. You're not doing all this other stuff. Um, the radical acceptance of all of it, which allows you to be present. Oh yeah. It's like, you, you, uh, it's so powerful. And then genuinely happy for my competitors when they do well. Mm. Like a- absolutely. That's another thing that changed for me. It was kind of, we're doing this all together. And when they do well, I do well when they do well, the rising tide is going to float all the boats because if they're not doing well, you, I have to be pushed by competition. We all kind of do like the decathlon's too hard to like, if you, you got to run for something, you know? Um, and so that ended up happening as well. So 2009, all this is being put into place. I don't only looking back, do I realize like, Oh, that's what happened. Uh, but I won the world championship. I was the best athlete in the world. Um, it was, radical and awesome. And it was another one of those moments where I just woke up and was like, what just happened? That was a year after the loss at the Olympics? One year, 12 months later. Yeah. How after, did that feel? I mean, good, you know. Like, <laughs> Unsatisfied still? Solid. Or was still more? No, compl- I, I think there's, I have an interview afterwards where I'm like, man, all of it was worth it. I think that, that I say that over and over again, where all the extra stuff that I, I had done in the professionalization of my craft, <laughs> Um, taking all the extra time, putting in all the extra work, all the mental preparation, all the just, all the, you know, before cold tubs were cool, you know, doing all that extra stuff. Um, And it it really gratifying and and surreal. Like a, a little kid from Alabama is now the world's greatest athlete. And I think it was the sec third highest score in US history at the time top 10 in the world, seventh all time in the world. I had only been doing it for six years, seven years, six years. Impressive. And I, and, and it was surreal. It was just weird. Like what? It, it worked. It was almost like, Oh, they bought it. Like (sighs) you feel like not fake, but like, I can't believe this worked. How did I, how did this just happen? And then the, like the score pops up and you're like, Whoa, higher than I ever thought any, like I would ever score, you know? Um, you proud of yourself? I am now. 
mean, at the time, obviously, there's that pride, like, that was cool. Of course, that I was put some, all this work in it. That was it. something cool that I did. And um, your, your world changes, like, big time. I went from nothing to world champion. There wasn't, like, climbing the ranks thing. It was just, like, one's in, I was a zero, now I'm a one. How did that affect your your life outside of the sport? Like socially, were you getting more opportunities, more publicity, more recognition? Or was, you know, how did that? It was early. Companies weren't, like Twitter launched five or tw- like a month or sorry. Twitter had launched like a year before that. Instagram didn't exist. Facebook was just now getting into like general population. Mm-hmm. Um, so it wasn't like a big, big deal. But like I was on, yeah, did the, cover of like outside magazine. I got a, a Red Bull deal. I got a bunch of stuff starts happening. Um, and then it, then it went from like, okay, I can exist and make a living to, oh, I can, I'm going to make more money than I ever thought I would ever make, you know, being an engineer or an accountant or something like that. And it, that was the dip, big lifestyle. I was like, oh, I need to get my stuff together. I got to figure this out. If this is how it's going to be, I'm looking, I'm looking down the list. I'm like, I don't know if anybody else is going to beat me because I'm, I'm young. I'm going to have another eight years of this. Um, but yeah, it just went from like, oh, I hope I can hang on and get to 2012 and then I'll retire to let's see how far I can go. Let's see how good I can be. Let's see how long I can do this. Um, so I'd still set on the Olympics and the Olympic gold. So take us yeah. to, to that journey from being one year after that, failing collapse and the intensity and the, and forcing you to refocus and develop these tools and then working your way up 12 months later, becoming the best in the world. And talk about the Olympic, like, is it still hanging in the background? You know, cause the Olympics only happens every four years, which I can't yeah. imagine training for that in that way. Yeah. Uh, so that focus, talk about the journey over the next three years. Is, is the Olympic kind of always there kind of dangling that carrot in front of you? Like that's the thing at next thing. Cause I've already accomplished the best in the world at the, the world champions. I I think professionally, I I did a really good job, again, about compartmentalization. There's so many little boxes you have to check on the way to the Olympics, and it's a four-year cycle. Uh, But it's really a four-year cycle for like brands and the general public. For us, we have world championships. And so I took each year as this individual challenge of like, what is there to accomplish this year? What could I do? What things do I want to do to lead into to 2012? Um, and I, I kind of checked all those boxes for myself. I know I went, I won a medal in the indoor world championships and then I've backed up my world championship, uh, in 2011. They happen every other year. And so I was back to back world decathlon champion. And, um, the only thing that happened out of that is I ended up tearing the ligament, my elbow completely shredded. My elbow was just flopping around, um, it happened in the, in, the, in javelin. the javelin, my last attempt, my last throw in the javelin. And so I ran the 1500 just taped up in a complete, in just an L and ran like a robot and ended up, I hung on, um, won the title, which was the most important box for me to check leading into London. But then it, now it was this big, what if now it was like, well, Trey's probably not even going to make the team. He just had total reconstructive surgery mega Tommy John surgery. Um, we'll, we'll see. We'll see, buddy. And how, how long before the Olympic trials did you tear? It was, in, I had the surgery in late September. And then when is you needed to make the team by late June? Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I've given a couple of keynote speeches on the unsexy little things that have to be put in place that you have to do you have to learn to love and you have to fall into that beautiful routine of like doing the unsexy, fundamental, stabilizing things. So discipline. I'm a, yeah, it, I, I took discipline for granted until I retired, but it really was, I, I meticulously wrote down everything I did in my re- rehab for my arm. And it was like 300 and something thousand repetitions of like, this, this with no weight, just holding a weight and just trying to get my arm straight for three months, you know? Um, was the, was the, cause you have to have a strong why to work through that. And was it, was there still a seed of that needing to 
kind of shift that story of that failure on the world stage at the Olympics and wanting to make it there to kind of have you show up with that amount of discipline of like, I need to make this happen and heal this so that I can get there back there. Yeah. Maybe a little, little column A, a little column B probably. Um, but then column C and I don't know who, who gave me this seed or when it was planted, but I really just wanted to look back on that year, you know, 12 months after surgery, I really just wanted to look back on that year with no regret, with no, ah, man, you, you gave up or, ah, you could have done more. Or I think everyone gets to this point at some, some stage, no matter what endeavor it is that you, you can get to this point and you're looking out and you're like, okay, I could give it my best from here on and I, and I might fail and it's going to be embarrassing. So I'm just going to stay, I'm just going to stay back. And I'd rather not attempt this. I'd rather not push forward. And there's some times where like cut your losses and get out makes a lot of sense. But more often than not, there's ego in the way of putting yourself out there. And I was open about what I was doing. I was open about going to London and trying to win gold. I, I did everything I could possibly do short of taking a banned substance and doing something legal. Um, was that ever on the table? I guess no. an option. No, I, I, it's so wild when I hear, st- I think it's way more prevalent, like in distance running where, I mean, road racing and like, there's just a lot more opportunities to earn money. Uh, we got like, two opportunities to earn money as a decathlete. Um, and I never saw it. I was never approached. I never tried it. One of the, that's still to this day, like a really great compliment. Someone who's like, yeah, we always thought you were dirty. Like, thank you. That's really nice. That's just because you're crushing fools. That's, yeah, yeah. It's kind of you to say, cause I, I beat drug cheats. Like there's some Russians that got banned. Um, so a guy got silver behind me in, in Berlin in 09. But I, I just, that's it. I just wanted to look back on that time and be proud of my younger self. And I, I still use that kind of mechanism to this day, um, whether in business or fatherhood or something where I just, I don't want to look back on that, on these moments and feel like I've wasted them. And I, I threw a lot of weighted balls, but never didn't throw a javelin. I threw the javelin three times uh, prior to the Olympic trials in 2012. I was really fit. I wasn't super fast, but I was really, really fit because I knew, okay, we might have to run the run for it in the 1500. Um, and I could do the other events, not crazy well, not as good as I had been doing them, but they were enough. And I was really fortunate that the US didn't have like a lot of depth in the decathlon. And so I just kind of squeaked through. Um, I threw the minimum. I think I threw 51 meters or 54 meters, something like that in the Olympic trials, which is terrible. And I squeaked through, made it on the Olympic team. And it was the, like the happiest I'd ever been after a a meet, because again, I, I gave myself the chance and did my best. And had I not made the team, I still would have been just as happy because I, I made it there. Mm. Um, And you put it all on the table. You're like, no regrets. Very exposed, very, you know, every, I mean, yeah. And so grateful. It allowed me to expand my network of people that I relied on. You know, I really leaned on the the medical training staff at Texas. I really asked a lot of my coaches because we had to plan B everything. I had to spend extra time with everyone, right? Um, Because as a professional, you don't have the network, you know, and I also didn't have the funds to create a network. Mm. Um, And it was, it was really, it was just amazing. It was just really a fun year. Um, and then took kind of that, those feelings from that 2009 season and that whole summer just accepted things as they came, knew I was in London with house money. No one thought I was going to do anything special. You know, I, so in Berlin, I, I won, I scored 88,790 points, which was a really good top 10 in the world, all, seventh all time at the time. And in the Olympic trials, I think I scored like 8,200 like 8,200 points, like barely over the Olympic standard, barely scraping in, probably just outside of the top 10 in the world. So Trey's at the meet, but he's not a threat because of his elbow, like whatever, you know? And How long is it from the, uh, like making the Olympic team to the actual competition? I don't remember exactly, but it's, it's in that four to six week 
Right. Oh, okay, so, so it's pretty close. Yeah, uh, so you're so not like boom, going boom. back to the lab and doing, there's not like a Rocky montage. It's okay. like- Okay, so you barely right. made the team, barely even made the minimum marks to even have a chance to make the team. And six weeks later, you're competing in the Olympics. Yeah, it, 10 months-ish, 10 and a half. Yeah, like 10 and a half months after surgery, I'm in London lining up for the 100. What would you say your elbow's at, like 80%? It was, I mean, it was solid, but like throwing wise to throw a jet, I could throw a football. Okay. It was probably like 70% for the football and on it, like 50% trust for the jab. It's trust thing too, right? It's like, it's capable. It's strong. The surgery did its thing, but there's that mental piece of if I go all out on this thing, am I going to shred my elbow again? And every ortho and my, my <laughs> doc that did the surgery said it's going to take two years to cook, you know, to like really cook oh, down wow. and turn into a ligament. And I'd done everything I could do. And I hadn't thrown well at the trials, but I'd thrown and I hadn't taken any steps backwards. So it was kind of like, okay, see what happens. Well, I have a really great first day and I'm in second or third, I think I'm in second or third. And then after the first couple of events of the second day, the, I, I hurdle great. I almost set the decathlon world record in the hurdles. Uh, I just, it kind of out of nowhere, like, okay, we're onto something here. Discus goes great. Pole vault goes good enough. Um, and after the pole vault, I mean, if I had pole vaulted really well, like up to my personal best, there would have been a shot for gold. But now I was in this fight for fourth, fifth, third, second, and we're going into the javelin. And it just is this, this moment and I'm, I'm warming up. I'm kind of, I just pick, I'm not doing like throws. I'm like, I need to save every effort. And the physiotherapists have just taped this thing up. I could have like, a semi truck could not have bit my elbow, you know. Uh, and I'm th I'm throwing like late in the number, late in the in the rotation. And the guy that's in right behind me is an unbelievable javelin thrower and just bombs one. And I'm like, oh shit. And I'm sit I'm just thinking to myself, I'm like, okay, a week from now, a year from now. I'm either going to regret my effort right now with a healthy elbow or I'm going to be satisfied that I did everything that I could do with maybe still a healthy elbow. Maybe it's broken. Maybe it's not. It's taped up as good as anyone's ever taped up an elbow. So I walk to the back of the runway. I'm next up in, in the rotation. Hardy's on deck. Um, and I look at my coach and he's like, what are you feeling? I was like, I don't care if I destroy my elbow. I'm going to throw it as hard as I can. He's like, without missing a beat, he goes, fuck it. Like he goes, yeah. And we fist bump. And we always historically like fist bumped really hard. Like I hit, I hit it. I hit his hand so hard uh, that later there were those little bubbles on my knuckles. Mm. Um, and so I get to the back of the runway, first throw. 10 meters farther than I threw at the Olympic trials. It's like 62 meters. Well enough to win a medal now. Now I'm in medal contention. Now, I mean, I've got a medal locked up unless I completely cramp up in the 15 and roll off the track and get no points. Like we're in there. So now the second round's coming up. I've already kind of processed those emotions of like, I just want an Olympic medal. <sighs> like the relief that you feel. So now it's almost, I was already playing with house money. Now I've just hit like three blackjacks in a row. Let's push it all to the middle and see what happens now. My elbow feels okay. And I go back again. He's like, I don't throw anymore. Like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm going to throw one more time. And I don't care. Let's do this. We're not going to get, this is the only chance we're going to have. And he's like, okay, let's do it. Fist bump, throw it again. And I throw within like one foot of my all-time personal best. Makes no sense. From a short approach, throwing like easy. I was throwing really hard, but it's a short approach. So you can't throw that hard. And it, I, I've never been, I've never experienced that feeling. It's on the internet. If you search like Trey Javelin, London or something like that, I've never felt that ever. Not, not, it, not that it's better. It's just different than anything else I've ever felt. And it, I had no, and it was just this like ultimate stamp on like, if you just do your best, odds are it's going to turn out pretty well. Describe the feeling yeah. for us. Like, what was it? Was it 
What was it like? What did it feel like in your body? Was there, what was different about it? I don't know if I can. You made a bet on yourself and you made a bet on yourself every single day for 12 months or, you know, 10 and a half months, every single day you got out of bed and told the world, I'm going to be ready to go by this date. And by all accounts, by history, by your surgeon, you should not have been ready to go. But everything that I did was right. And every movement I made was correct. And everyone that I had around me were the right people that needed to be around me. And everything that had ever happened to me in my life had been for a reason to get me to that runway, to do that thing in that moment. And it was this ultimate, like, I remember, th- like, like God is so good and so faithful. And I, I would have probably said those things had it not happened. But it was just, I had so much belief and trust that what I was doing was going to work that it flowed through you. And, it, and I jumped higher than I had ever, than I jumped in the high jump earlier, like, like, like the day before. And I just had this like, it wasn't contraction, but I was just so, it was like this release of energy. And I was... I ran halfway around the track. I came back around. I got to, I saw my, my coach, my agent and two of my buddies that had just flown out to London to see me compete. They, they screamed, streamed down and we were hugging and high five in the middle of a competition. And it just, if you watch the video, you can see all of that. You can see this whole, like, it, 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 yeah, it just all those bets at that moment. There was still one event to go, but it, they all it all just hit. It all just hit red seven, you mm-hmm. know. And it's like that investment every single day was just stacking, 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 stacking. Keep going, and keep I, focused. And I you, and you keep letting it ride, and then it hit. Like it act, it actually hit, and it, we're, I'm not this is a bad analogy. It's not all about money, but it was just this thing that hit and it was like it all, normally you would have that kind of reaction after you won or after something really cool happened. I was, I knew I'd won the medal. I knew I'd won the silver medal. Nothing was going to take that away. I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to get gold, but I was, I wasn't going to get bronze. I was going to win a silver medal after that 2008 experience, you know? And Again, it's hard to describe, but it's like everything I've just said times a, a million. I can feel it. And I, I mean, just the, 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 just the inklings of the reverberation from that moment so long ago in time now from you explaining it. And I think that's the great thing about the Olympics, right? Like it's four years yeah. to, to have such a catastrophic failure and taking us through kind of the immaturity, the lessons, the growth, the inability to handle the big stage. And then to get to a point where it's just like four years of hard focused work to shift that story and to have an opportunity even to barely squeak by to get it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Oh man. Yeah. And then getting the rug pulled out from under you the year before, like right before like you're, yeah, it was, and I draw on that all the time. Like I really do. And all, a lot of the stuff that, I'm, that I do in fatherhood and in life in general and business, my relationships as a husband, like just not wanting to regret time, not wanting to regret the way that I choose to spend my time. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, man. So top of the mountain experience. I mean, I'm sure you've, it's hard to, to even imagine that level of elation and energy just because of so much, just the story in itself is like created that level of expansion, top of the moment, top of the mountain moment. Uh, Take us through the end of your career and the loss of all that, like the focus, the mindset it takes, the why, the proving people wrong, like your high school coach and then 
you know, shifting the story and Wait, healing. before we do, before we do, I want to hear about your moment. Which moment? What was your kind of like top of the mountain fruition of where you could, you look back and you're like, man, really proud of myself. Like I bet on myself. I'm here. Oh man. I've got, it's a, it's a pretty long story as far as my, my journey. Cause it was, it was very up and down, we've but got, I, I would got, say the, we've got time. We've got time. <laughs> Because you got to create context. I would say, you know, just to sum it up, um, it's similar to that the energy you had when you were in 2000 and 2008, when you were a little bit immature, kind of like shit don't stink, I'm here, and 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 it really is around taking responsibility and taking radical responsibility. It was my my first real big awakening, and it was my my third year in the NFL. Uh, I thought I was going to be the starter entering training camp because the starting center was retiring. I was going from right guard over to center to take over, at least I thought. And out of nowhere, uh, we drafted a center, the best center in college football with our top pick going into the year. And that was like rug ripped out from under me. Mm -hmm. And like nobody communicated that with me. And so I went into deep victim mindset. Like you found out on... TV or TV. social media. Yeah. I was watching TV with my friends and it was crazy because my friend who's a tight end, Tony Gonzalez was playing and he was set to retire pretty soon. It was like mm-hmm. later in his career. And he was like, man, we're going to draft a tight end. We're going to draft a tight end. I'm going to be fucked. I'm not going to be on the team. And he was just like sweating bullets. And I was like, you're going to be fine, dude. You're Tony Gonzalez. You're good. Uh, no, it wasn't Tony. It was a third string tight end oh, okay. that was gotcha. worried about us drafting a tight end because then that means there's only so many spots, yeah. right? So he'll get cut. So he comes up to me and he's like, because Twitter, the picks come up like a couple couple minutes before it on TV and he comes up to me. He's like, dude, you're not going to believe this. I'm like, what, what? He's like, we're drafting a center. And it was, I just never forget the moment. I just felt it. It's like this, like my heart sank. And I'm like, no way. And I've never felt so betrayed, humiliated, like all of the wounding, just all in that moment. And I, I went into a victim mindset and barely made the team the following year. Uh, and was really just depressed. I was drinking a lot, taking pain pills, doing drugs, ended up getting to a point where I got uh, popped on a PED test for taking Adderall. So I got suspended for four games in the middle of the season. And this is all while the Falcons are having one of the best years in franchise history. So we ended up- 16, 15, 16? 2012. Okay. We're 13 and three. It was the year we went to the NFC Championship game. Um, And yeah, I uh, came back from that and I, it, that was a big wake up call getting suspended. And so I was like, okay, I need to refocus. And so I came back after that suspension, but it was, the damage was done. I was like a dead man walking the whole team. It was weird. Like they didn't, nobody looked at me. The coaches didn't talk to me. And I was like, holy shit. And I just saw the writing on the wall. Like they're going to fucking cut me. And so I'll never forget two days before Christmas, it was like week 16 or 15 in the season. We were about to be the number one seed locked. Uh, and I got a call from, uh, a scout and said, you know, coach wants to see you bring your playbook. And I went in there and GM was sitting there, head coach and sat down. And I remember walking in the room and it was just like, I was like above my body. Like it was just like the most insane, like out of body experience, really intense. And I sat down and it was interesting because up until the point I sat down, I was still like playing the story of like, they don't know how good I am. They're not giving me a chance. I'm better than all these guys. You know, the stories mm-hmm. of like, I'm, I'm better than what they're viewing me as, you yeah. know, is that, that, oh man. And so I sat down and when they said the words, I said, Joe, we're going to, we're going to let you go. It was like whew, filled with regret. And I had never experienced that before. And I, I, it was the, it was all of the responsibility just flooded into me. It's like, nobody gives a fuck. And I did this to myself. And I'm going to be on the street with my dream of this opportunity of playing in the NFL and becoming a starter squandered. And how old were you? Uh, I was 23, I think. Oh, so I mean, still, as we sit here today as men, like just a, a babe. Yeah, very young, psychologically yeah. immature for mm-hmm. sure. And this was a big moment because um, I never really spoke up for myself. And for some reason, there was something that overtook me. And I was like, I asked him a simple question. And I don't really remember how the conversation went. I was kind of blacked out, but something spoke through me. And I said, you know, you guys are 
this team's about to be the number one seed in the playoffs. And if the starting center, because when I got suspended, they brought in another guy from a practice squad mm-hmm. to replace me on the roster for, for the for four games. And they basically decided they're going to keep him over me. And I basically asked them, if the starting center gets hurt uh, in the first you know, game of the playoffs, who are you going to trust to take you to the Super Bowl? This, this new guy or me? And they sat with it. And it was interesting that that wasn't something they thought about, you know, which tells you a lot about the NFL and these really big business and the people in the powerful positions. It, they don't, there's not a lot of common sense there. Well, they're all humans. Like yeah. You tend to put these people up way, way higher than your average Joe, but everybody's a human. Yeah. yeah. And so I said that and they said, I guess we're going to have to trust the other guy. And I was like, okay, that's all I wanted to hear. And my agent was already, already made aware. So I was going to get claimed on waivers, get a fresh start, go on a new opportunity. And I was just starting to focus my mindset on like, okay, let's refocus. Let's start building a new foundation. I went and did the whole checkout. I was walking through the locker room, like just deep grieving, like mm-hmm. just like uncontrollable cry. Like I saw a couple of my teammates cause it was an off day and I just like couldn't even use words. It was like so intense, the amount of energy I was feeling turned my pads into the equipment. I signed the medical papers. uh, And then I was up in the office like 15 minutes after getting cut. I was signing the final papers. And because I was on the roster for the most of the year, I was going to get compensation if we went to the Super Bowl, even though I wasn't on the team. And so he was explaining this all to me. And then the guy's phone rang and he answered it. He was like, hey. And he's like, oh. And I was like, this is weird. And he's like, oh, uh, that was Thomas Dimitrov, the GM. He, He wants to talk to you real quick. And so I was like, oh. And this like little inkling of hope like sparked in me. I'm like, that doesn't happen often. And so I just, their office is right across this, right across the hall from this. I walked over there and they sat me down and they said, Joe, we thought about what you said and we're going to keep you on the roster. And I was like, holy cow. I don't know if I've ever heard of anyone else talking their way out of getting cut <laughs> yeah. like that. And uh, something I said uh, must have stuck with them. They talked about it. Um, and then two weeks later when we were dressing for the playoffs, I was on the sideline as the backup. Um, we ended up winning the first game and then lost in the NFC championship to go to the Super Bowl. Um, and then that, so that, that moment really changed my, the trajectory of not only my life, my career, like the whole journey in the NFL. And I had the same similar story. I don't like, there's going to come a day when I'm not playing this game anymore, but it's not going to be because I didn't give it my all. And someone just said, Hey, like we're done with you. I'm going to give everything I have. And when I walk away, I want to walk away on my own terms with zero regrets because I can live with that. And so that's changed everything. And I I showed up every day and and worked my ass off. I completely just shifted that perspective that the team had around me that off season. I was like training and and just crushing it. And uh, I was competing with that top draft pick the following year. And I was in the best shape of my life. I was really focused and I outplayed him in every way possible during training camp. And they still gave him the job. And I was like, fuck. And this is my fourth year, my contract year. And so I was like, I'm, I'm out of here. I'm going to go to a new team and uh, have a fresh opportunity, fresh start. It's just so hard to change those first impressions. And nine games into that season, that center wasn't playing well. Our team wasn't doing very well. So they benched him and they called me and said, Joe, we're going to give you a shot. And so they gave me an opportunity to play that final seven games before my hit free agency. And I crushed it. Uh, and then they ended up not signing me back right away. They offered me like a minimum deal. And I was like, all right, I'm going to test free agency. I'm going to get an opportunity. And uh, ended up getting an opportunity to go, like the, the Indianapolis Colts were really into me. They wanted to sign me. The Falcons found out the night before free agency started. And they realized they didn't want to lose me. So the Falcons ended up signing me to a two-year, $6 million deal. And I was like, fuck, I did it. I made it. Like I got the deal. And like, yeah. I didn't think I was going to go back to Atlanta. But now I earned the job after... That moment in their office, it took like a year and a half, two years. And I finally earned their respect. They paid me the money. They, they bet on me. Mm. It's time. And then I came back to Atlanta and I was entering my fifth year. First time I was the starter. I was the leader on the team. I, I was just like, fuck, I made it. Like this is, this is, now I'm going to have my own 10-year career. And this is what I was working hard for. Mm. And then four games into that season, I blew my knee out. And complete ACL, MCL, reconstruction, 11-month recovery, And, you know, nine months after the surgeries when training camp started. So I ended that, uh, entered that year as a starter and they just kind of took it easy. Uh, Ended up having, my knee basically wasn't, wasn't healing 100%. It was like 80%. So they ended up cutting me. And then I went down to Tampa and, uh, and this is a big, like the first moment I had like a trust that everything's happening for a reason. It was really hard to experience the getting cut. 
because uh, they cut me on, on a Monday after all the final cuts and all the team rosters were made. Mm-hmm. So they kind of screwed me in that way. So there was no starting opportunities. And so I was like, fuck, and my agent's like, someone's going to get hurt or there's going to be an opportunity. You just got to be patient. And week two, our offense coordinator down in Tampa Bay was my offense coordinator in, in, in Atlanta the year before. And so he knew what I was about. And he's like, hey, Joe, he called me up. He said, we don't have a starting job. We just signed a, a starting center free agent that for, to a big money contract. But I need someone that can play all three inside positions as a backup. And I trust you. So work out the money with the, with the front office and we'd love to have you. So I end up going down there on like a minimum deal, but mm-hmm. there's all these playtime escalators. Yeah. So I could hit like three and a half, four million dollars a year if I play right away. And the odds of that happening are very slim. Yeah. And so I went down there week two. If I hit 90% of playtime, which is basically starting the whole year, uh, then I'll hit an escalator, which will escalate my next year and trigger all these bonuses. Like rollover yeah. salaries and stuff. And, uh, the first play of the second half, I was down. We were in the Superdome at New Orleans, and I barely know any of my teammates' name. I got there on Wednesday. <laughs> I'm learning the playbook again, learning all this stuff. <laughs> yeah. Sunday, they asked me, like, Joe, is your knee good? And I'm like, yeah, I'm good. He's like, not really good, but I'm like, I'll take some pain pills. Whatever you this. say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever you need me to say, yeah, that's like, what I'm let's saying. Let's go. I want to play. I'm ready to, to do this thing. And so I was on the sideline the first half, and they, they have this starting center that they, they paid on a free agent deal, pretty big money. And so he goes out there, first play of the second half, rolls his ankle. I'm like, okay, let's go. I go out there. And so like, you know, James Winston, it's his rookie year. He comes over. Like nobody really knows, who, like who's this guy that just yeah. came over from Atlanta? And I go out there and I just ball out. Yeah. And I, I remember the first play, I'm like, I look to my right and there's a rookie right guard. And so I'm, I'm my, like the, the playbook is the same we ran in Atlanta the like years before. So mm-hmm. I had to like relearn it. But a lot of the terminology from the offensive line specifically were different. So like little things like Ugh. a scoop block over here, we'd call like an ace or a single. And that guy's a rookie. So that guy's a rookie. So all he knows. He's by the book. Yep. He's like, this is what it is. And he's really smart, but he like learned exactly how he was supposed to. The guy to my left is Logan Mankins, who's 11 year pro, who's a pro bowler, one of the best. He's probably going to go to the Hall of Fame. And so he, like, we'd have like an unspoken communication. Like he knows mm-hmm. what he's doing, but this guy got to kind of tell. And so I looked to the right, I'm like, single, single. And I remember the rookie, he looks at me, he's like, what the fuck's a single? And I'm like, just, you know, like that guy. And then there's like, so, and we like hike and oh uh, end up crushing it, dude. And I ended up playing, it was a six week injury. The guy had a high ankle sprain. And after six weeks, um, they end up saying, we're going to stick with Joe because Joe's playing so well. Ended up starting the next 30 games. I hit all my escalators, which allowed me yes. to retire when I did. Um, so it is a bit, it's like a wild journey. I'm writing a book about it right now. Just a lot of ups and downs. I mean, I lost my starting job five different times in the NFL and had to <sighs> re-identify and retell the story of who I am and work my way back. Yeah. But I love the, just the, the story of having it be up to you. And I think that's the same, the same one that, that I have of just looking back and having that no regret, being proud of the effort and not letting it, not, not finishing and being like, that was my fault. Yeah, totally. And I'm really grateful that that happened because then I, when I walked away, it was on my own terms. And when I was, I was ready. I was, I was part of me, like my final year, I was, I, I felt like my body was breaking down. I had made enough money because I hit all those escalators of like, do I sacrifice more of my health for wealth? And I started con- contemplating that. And I, I started reading more books and expanding my awareness and understanding that the brain trauma that was, I was sustaining with like, the lawsuit around CTE that was coming out like middle of my career, which, which really forced me, it developed this fear of, of early onset dementia. Was there a lot of fear in locker rooms at that time? Like when all that was coming out, it was kind of this unspoken thing. I imagine like everyone kind of knew like, this is not the best, but then when the actual science was published, what was it like in locker rooms? Like I know a lot of the ways in which practices were conducted were changed, but what was it like just man to man? Yeah, I didn't like the movie Concussion came out like right around mm-hmm. the same time. I didn't watch it because I knew it would create a story in my mind that I wouldn't be able to play in the same way. Mm-hmm. So I just I stayed away from it. I remember our right tackle uh, watched the movie on like the plane to one of the games, and he had a really bad game. First of all, when we played, we went down and played the Chargers, and he wasn't the same. That rest of that season, it was, he was always like, I don't want to, like his head wasn't in it. And he was just always playing timid. And I didn't want to do that. But I, I, I understood like, I, I've, it's not, not whether if I have brain trauma, it's the depth and, and impact and, and how bad is it. Yeah. 
And so that really, I'm grateful for it because it led me on this path of, of really learning, like, how can I take care of my brain health and learning about high inflammatory foods and neurogenesis, neuroplasticity. And it's actually what got me into the plant medicine path and psychedelics because I saw these brain scans of these brains just lit up from doing psilocybin experiences. Like, dang, like if that's something that can really help me in my longevity and, and be proactive about my brain health, I'm going to try it out. And that led to some deeper expansion of, of awareness and consciousness as well. That's still the coolest story. Like at, from the beginning, like in the offices in Atlanta and saying like, like call, not calling their bluff, but just like going to bat for yourself and, almost, and feeling like it's this third person. that's like something deep down buried inside of you knew you needed to fight for yourself even if you weren't all, all the way there, like that moment of, yeah, I don't know how this happened, but it happened. And I'm really happy. Like, I'm really proud of my, myself in that moment. Like, you don't even remember what you said. Yeah. Like it was this other thing, this out-of-body experience. It's just incredible. That's what the NFL is like. <clears throat> it's really interesting because you play in college for the love of the game. And then when you go to the NFL instantly, you're, you're a business. Mm -hmm. And what, what the front office does, the training staff, like the entire organization, unless you're like a top draft pick where they're kind of like, hey, like you're our guy. We know you're going to be, we invested you, invested in you. You're like a be marketable better. poster. Yeah, it's like one or two guy. guys in the draft each year. There's like 30 to 50 rookies that come in or new players that come in each year. And, you know, as a middle round drafted guy, it's like, it's like the, they, they're, there's this manipulation of trying to, because they know it's a business, but you're, I'm 21 years old and I'm like my uh, wide eyed, like, holy shit. Like I've came from UNLV. This is the big time. I'm playing next to Tony Gonzalez, Matt Ryan, like Roddy White, Julio Jones. I'm like, holy fuck. Like, do I belong here? And it wasn't until I went through that experience where I stood up for myself, where I realized, oh, this is a business and nobody gives a fuck about my business. They're all, they're all worried about their own business, their own individual business. Everybody in the front office, everybody in the training room, everybody mm -hmm. in the kitchen cooking their food is looking out for themselves because they're a part of this organization. And it's really fascinating because there's this, you, there's this need to, to be a pro and look after numero uno, which is yourself, mm -hmm. but also create this team dynamic where you have to have like a really strong bonds to go perform on Sundays. So there's a lot of mental, emotional, psychological games that happen that is, is a challenge that you don't even really know. And it, they, they talk about becoming a pro and that's a part of it. And it wasn't until that third year when I went through that experience where it's like, I don't care if the strength coach comes in and says, Hey, I don't want you working out extra. Or I don't want you to do doing this in the weight room. Cause we did, we had a coach that was kind of a narcissist when I was early there and he would really like throw the, his shit on the younger guys and be mm. best friends with the older guys. And so it was really challenging. And he was kind of one of the first people in the NFL doing functional movement stuff. Okay. And, but we didn't really do powerlifting. And so as an offensive lineman, like I, I need to fucking put some weight on my back yeah. and squat or else I'm not going to be able to do this thing. But he was like, no, you need to do this. And so when I shifted that perspective, I went in there as the first one in the weight room, last one to leave. And I just, I didn't give a fuck what anybody said. I was like, I'm going to do what I know I need to do to mm -hmm. be in here. Cause this is my livelihood and my job. And that changed everything. Taking ownership of it and mm -hmm. taking that responsibility and not taking the, the control mm -hmm. away from everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And I was ready to walk away. There was a part of me that was excited. I'd made enough money to feel financially free mm -hmm. and you know, a couple of weeks after, after my final game, the finality of it really hit me like a ton of bricks. It was like this void in my heart and it was really intense to process. And it led me on this journey of, of, of really being confronted with the deeper questions. Like, like, who am I? What am I going to do now? What's my purpose? What's the deeper meaning in life? And I had to go figure that out. And it, it, I'm still integrating that five years later. Just now, I think we talked about a little bit of, you know, even relaunching this podcast and being able to use my athletic journey as a platform, as a, as, as a, as a voice, uh, been a big part of my story. I had a lot of resistance to that up until very recently. And that's why I'm relaunching this podcast and, and really sharing the story because it was, there's a lot of healing, a lot of grief, a lot of uh, shame around my career as well. Like not, it not turning out the way I had imagined it, you know? Mm -hmm like you going and winning a medal and reaching the top, like you, you, you didn't get the gold, but you, I mean, you accomplished a lot. 
And then what do you do when it's, when it's all over? Like, how did you, how did you process the end? I, I mean, just like you still, still processing, still trying to figure it out. I retired in, in 2017. Um, we had started a family and I think just o- over all of this stuff, I think the shift that I have is there is no, there's no answer. There's no thing that's going to make this all go away and feel better. I started, I began to understand that I will never feel what I felt back then. Ever. I'll be, I'll be lucky if I get close to it, but that was a very, it's a unique experience to be so, I was built for the decathlon and I was so on purpose. I was so aligned in where I was supposed to be, when I was supposed to be around the people I was supposed to be around. I, I, everything was so like just ordained and, and there I got caught up trying to find that again and trying to maybe almost artificially create it and, and just living in daily frustration of it not existing. And when you say it, is it a feeling that you're chasing or is it? Being on purpose. I think you, you know what that feels like Mm -hmm. specifically. I think athletes specifically know what that feels like because you're in this thing that your body was, was built for, that you're good at, that you achieve success, that you get to the, the highest of heights with, um, and you're, you're, you're compensated well for it. It it just is a, a, a friend of mine talked about a frayed wire, tons of current running through it. And when you're on purpose, it's plugged into something. It's plugged in and it's powering some engine of, of, of your desire, whatever that is. And after the, the engine gets shut off, immediately that wire gets cut. And now still tons of electricity is flowing through. Tons of, of discipline and character and desire and talent and want to still flowing through, but it's not plugged into anything and it's sparking and it's throwing off sparks all around it because I wasn't even trying to manage it. I, I wasn't processing anything. I wasn't like working on myself. I was trying to find something to distract myself with and hoping it was the next thing. You know, I was trying to be patient, watching opportunities float by, trying to grab the next one and do the next thing and trying to recreate what I just had, trying to recreate, oh, everything's going to be like this. Well, I'm all of a sudden you're, I mean, I'm 33, 34 years old, having spent 15, 16 years being basically a professional and having a full career and you step out. Now all my all my friends and everyone around me is 15 years into an actual career. They're on the 10th floor of the building. And no matter what I choose to do, I'm going to walk in on, in the, I'm in the lobby, which is a feeling I, no one really likes feeling like a novice after having been an expert in anything really. And it's humbling and it was really scary. Still, it still is kind of scary, but I've, I've, over six or seven years, I've moved into this like very peaceful existence with my um, uneducation, like my, where I stand in life. And instead of running away, uh, that was the other thing I did. I turned away from my accomplishments. I turned away from the sport. I turned away from anything really physical or athletic. And I just said, you know, that that was, I, I, that's old. I, ne- I never was a boastful, like, hey, Trey Hardy, Olympian, nice to meet you. Um, it's a weird thing to say when you have like a big Olympic rings tattoo, but it just never was a part. You walk into our, my house, you would never know. I, that's what I did. You know, it just isn't a part of my existence outside of the, the confines of a stadium. Um, but it, it, it's not helpful to not own that part of my existence. The further and the older I get, the further away that I get from it, the cooler it is. It was really cool. I got to do the stuff that I got to do. And it was really amazing that I got to express my talent in such a very public and profound way. And, and 
I, I think I just had a terrible relationship with that immediately after I retired. And I, I tried to find something else to go be the best in the world at. And I honestly think that might have been like my LinkedIn little subheading when I retired. It's like former world, former best athlete in the world, world champion, whatever. And then searching for the next thing I'll be the best in the world at. How dumb is that? <laughs> like, are you, well, where did you Where did you, where did you search for that? Like, were you pursuing specific things? No, like I went back and I, I, we had a real estate portfolio here that we managed and it uh, managed is a, is a very gracious term to call it. I mean, we owned a bunch of rental properties. So I was a landlord. I learned I could fix anything. I can do all that stuff. Um, just looked where we were going to place our money. Basically, I was a money manager and most of our assets were in single family homes here in Austin. And immediately, like four months after retiring, um, I got into an MBA program here that's super competitive. It was one of those like, I mean, Princeton Review, most competitive MBA programs. Um, and I put all my fire and energy into that, uh, ended up being valedictorian. And so then that became like, okay, I'm the valedictorian MBA. Like, let's go to work. I'm still not going to do that training athletic stuff. We're going, we're going to work. I'm going to do some, I'm going to land this private equity deal and then I'll be the CEO of this company. And then we're going to roll up all this stuff. We're going to do this, this, and this. And it's, it just wasn't scratching that itch. It, what do you think that was that, that resistance to working out or, or doing the movement thing? And then the desire to focus so hard on like, I need to find the thing to be, to excel at and be great at. Maybe I'll, I'll know that answer if I, when I get older. Um, but in, initially I think it just is the, this is the business and this was the, the brand. And I want, I'd like for people to associate Trey Hardy and what I stood for in sport with excellence outside in, in excellence in whatever the new endeavor was going to be. And I think any, I mean, anything I do, I, I'm going to do well. And not well, like successfully well, but I'm going to do my best and I'm going to do it the right way. And you're going to get the best effort out of me, no matter what it is. If it's washing your car or, you know, vacuuming a rug, making you dinner, whatever it is, I'm going to do it the best I can. And that's, that's my, that's who I am. That's what, that's how I was raised. That's how I conducted my professional career. But I really don't know why I, I wanted to, why I felt that compelled to, to do it. But you speak to the, the, the emotional process. Cause I, what I think, you know, going on, on my own journey and the resources that the NFL provides in the transition program are in a way really, really laughable. And it's really focused on like, you know, trying to find guys, new jobs or helping them with a the resume. But <laughs> There's nothing really that facilitates a safe space for feelings to be present. And on this journey I've been on, a lot of my healing is because I just needed to grieve the loss of an identity of everything I worked hard for, everything I received love for, everything I pursued greatness at, all the energy I put in, all the feelings of victory and defeat and just the identity of being a, an athlete at that level, everything of every aspect of who I was was built on that. And part of me, similar to you, I was, I was running away from the feeling of, of letting that go. And I was trying to fill that void with, with, okay, I can be great at something else and, and kind of stay on that pedestal. But what I really needed was to really feel the death of that and the grief and the letting go so that I could be reborn into who I am. And that's a constant process that is constantly happening. This death, rebirth, and all these stories. And the psychological death process is, is so powerful. And our society at whole is it's a big a part of a bigger systemic issue that we don't really have the tools or processes for those, those transitional periods. But as I've been able to access those emotions and feel the, the loss of that and the intensity of emotions in my heart, I've actually been able to integrate it into who I am and actually revisit it and talk about it. And now like own it, right. Instead of running away from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm really happy that you said the word death. I think that's the, when something dies, you have to grieve it. You have to grieve that loss. 
And it took me, yeah, six, seven years to like stretch out that grieving process and even recognize like, oh, I am grieving. And it's not this like ego death thing. I'm just grieving that life that I know what it feels like that, that feeling. I'm just grieving that part to admit that it's gone and to accept that it was, accept that it was good and accept that it's going to be a part of me moving forward, but only in memory and only in experience and not who I was and not continuing to play a, a large role in my life. I think you said it really, really well. And I, yeah, I tapped into, I mean, over the last 12 months have been really the culmination of all of that grief and all of that, really the shame that wasn't allowing me to grieve and all of the emotion just trapped in that frayed wire just exploded and it almost ruined my marriage. It almost ruined, you know, my relationship with my young kids. I, I was lost to all my friends. I went months without speaking to anybody. And I found myself in a hotel room in Eugene, Oregon during the world championships um, this summer. Looking for things I could use to end my life. This is the first time I've, I've talked about it, really. This will be public, but my friends know, and my wife definitely knows, but it was really scary, beyond scary. And there, there's no resource for... Olympians, there's no, there's nothing for us to prepare us for the grief, for, we're, we're just out there trying to process it all on our own, you know, and your family doesn't understand. The only people that really understand are your compatriots, are the people that are also doing that, the people that have been there before and professionals. And I, yeah, I was, I, I call it, I was just scraping. I was at the very, very bottom of the barrel and I needed to get there and I needed to, to get there to realize that I hadn't done any of the stuff that we're talking about. I hadn't grieved. I hadn't, I hadn't mourned. I hadn't, I had like just moved on and just not processed any emotion. I hadn't done any of that. And it was dragging me all the way down. And it felt like someone else was at the wheel, driving the car, and I was just screaming from the back seat and had no control over my life, over my emotions, over anything. And it, it goes way, there's all kinds of tangents within that. And earlier, I mean, you talked about the, like psilocybin and the ability to what that's doing in like maps and the ability for PTSD and TBIs and, and being able to process things and, and just not move on, but just aid and, and facilitate. And so I had an unbelievable therapist and had a, I've had a great experience with that medicine that helped me tap into all of those emotions that I've been burying, which for my entire life and face them and deepen my relationships with myself, with God, with my spouse, with my kids, with my friends, that without, I don't know if I'd be here today. And that, that's not like hyperbole or trying to be dramatic. It's very real. And if somebody is in any kind of if anybody, if that resonates with anybody, call me, hit me up on, on social media and let's, let's talk. 
because I've been there and it's close. And I sometimes just would have loved somebody to talk to, would have loved somebody to that is, that's been through it to just tell me it's it's going to be okay, you know. Because yeah, in some of my in therapy, I was sitting and I was talking to God, asking God, was that it? Was that my only purpose? Am I done? And and I got those answers. And it's it's just like we're talking about, you have to experience it to really understand it. I just don't I don't want if anybody's listening to to have to go through that. What was it like when you were in that hotel room and these thoughts of taking your own life? Where did you go? How did you get out of that? What what did you was it a wake up call like, oh wow, I'm really struggling and in that moment hitting rock bottom? How did you start pulling yourself out of that? I I managed to to talk to my wife. I've got a bunch of scary journal entries before, during, and and after. Um, I sought, you know, professional help talking to somebody who specializes in this kind of situation um, just to help me Again, give me the the toolkit to be able to stay present and feel like I have control, to feel like I'm everything that I'm feeling is valid. Um, and to process the death of what what I was and what's to come. And it, at, in those moments, it. I kind of, I don't know. I be, I just became a lot more grateful. I was always, I'm always grateful and thankful and happy for everything in my life. But it's hard to, and to answer your question, it's really hard to put, put my finger on any one thing. And I, because I still feel like that was, I'm at the bottom. It took me a while to get on my feet. Now I'm starting to look up. And we're climbing out of the, out of the bottom of everything still. So I still, I'm, I don't have any of those thoughts anymore. Like they're not even like fleeting thought. Like I wouldn't even recognize that person if he were sitting next to me today. And it definitely feels like a chapter that's closed and there's a def, there's a new chapter, but. Can you speak to the power of the psilocybin experience and kind of where that played into and the timing of seeking out that experience? Did you have resistance to it before? Was it kind of a place of I'll try anything because I need to really figure this out? And can you talk about that experience specifically? What realizations you had and then how it shifted your perspective and, and was a tool to help you start digging yourself out of this hole? Yeah, I had been off for, you know, a couple of years. And again, it super strained relationships. Um, marriage was difficult, especially three young children. It was really difficult. And I knew I did not want to get on any pharmaceutical drugs. I didn't want to take any, I don't know, I didn't want to be on drugs. You know, that's what I thought. I, I just knew I was going to stand firm on that. I'd had a, a therapist recommend it. Um, and I just said, I know there's got to be another way. I, I, I'm going to work myself out of this. Let's, we're just going to keep working. And I, I don't want to do drugs. That was just kind of it. Um, and from there, a f- one, of my, one of my close friends who, I mean, I think we've, we're all, we've all been on each other's shows and podcasts, uh, Cal, John Callahan had a friend to rec- recommend it to me and spoke with her once or twice on the phone and said, you know what, I think this, this could be an alternative and I don't have any other options. What, what's it going to hurt? I'd never 
taken mushrooms. I'd never done drugs. I'd never done anything like that. Um, and so I really had reverence for what it was. It was, it was, this is medicine that I'm taking. We had four or five really great therapy sessions prior to even to doing it. Um, and I was ready to do it. You know, I was very, very ready. It was, it wasn't this big grand ceremony. It was very clinical. Here are our steps. Here's what we're going to do. Here's the medicine. If you don't want to take it, that's still fine. I'm like, okay. And then like six or seven hours later, I had gone into regions of my, my heart, my mind, my subconscious and found or seen or interacted with countless feelings and suppressed moments and people I hadn't thought of. And I felt the entire spectrum of emotion from fear and hate all the way into like love that is hard to describe. Um, and the integration after the, that session has is still kind of ongoing, like still connecting the dots and met a lot of interesting people afterwards that have helped me with that as well. And I don't, I don't know. I'm, I don't know enough about it to recommend it to people, but for me, pretty sure it, it played a huge role in saving my life and saving my relationships with everyone, literally everybody, um, allowed me to connect. It's kind of, you don't know. It gave me a chance to experience all those feelings and all those emotions in a setting that afterwards allowed me to recognize them every day again. I wasn't feeling anything. I mean, I wasn't feeling any emotion. I wasn't loving. I wasn't being angry. I wasn't being sad. I wasn't doing any of that. But in, in that setting and since, I now see that. I feel the same love now when I see my wife. And I feel this warmth when my kids are around now. And I, I just have all of these things that were there, but I didn't know they were there. It was kind of like taking off blinders, like, oh, okay, I could hear you guys, but I just couldn't see you. Oh, mm. hey. And I have just, I have extreme presence. Where before I was all, I was somewhere else. Mm. I was still struggling with who am I questions? What am I doing here now questions. Yeah, I want to highlight the the power of the the feelings because I think a lot of people talking about psychedelics or what they may think about psychedelics is like this visionary space or it accesses different dimensions and you maybe see different visuals. But for me and what I'm hearing from you, the power that psychedelics have helped me with is accessing the somatic experience and the healing that takes place when you're able to access emotions. When we're living up here trying to figure it out, like what's my purpose? What am I going to do? You're not really tapping into the energy that is cultivated in the body. And when you suppress those emotions, that's what you're trying to make sense of. And it's really hard to process. And mushrooms have helped me get into my body and then actually feel safe enough and accessing the subconscious energies for me to feel fully. And I've had deep experiences of grief and energy but what I've found since working with those tools is now I have access to those emotions and an awareness of those emotions without them because they've tapped me into them. So now not just the love I have for people, but I can notice like if I'm feeling triggered or I'm feeling fear, or I'm feeling anxious or I'm feeling like, oh, there's some energy that feels off. I can develop, I've developed the tools now through accessing it with these plant medicines to go into those emotions and then be able to process them with the tools I've developed without having to go back into them. And so the somatic experience and the feelings, that's, that's, I just really want to highlight that because that is where a lot of the healing takes place is in the feeling, not in trying to figure it out up here. That's exactly it. That was, but that's my, the biggest lesson that I got and still it, every day get to use it every day that it wasn't that you're not having these feelings. You just get, you, you get to see them, you know, you get to fully, fully see them. Um, and 
recognize. I'm trying to think of like a really great analogy, but it's kind of having an experience and you know, if you see this pattern on a tree that there's a hundred dollars behind it, you've seen that a million times, but now, you know, there's treasure in, in where, in what this is. And every time you see it, you know, there's treasure in it. Instead of avoiding it, walking past it, not even thinking about it, not processing it, you can get this this gold is in all of that stuff. And I, for myself, I had just let it accumulate my entire life. Hadn't processed any of it, which really didn't allow me to fully love my wife and kids. It didn't allow me to fully love my, my own mother. You know, I'd used uh, sports. I'd used track and field and training and working out as a means of therapy. And, and dopamine and it was gone. So now I'm just left with life and the inability to process emotion and be present with my family. And I'm still learning it and I'm still figuring it out and I'm, I'm getting there. But that, those, those sessions unlocked all of that for me. And I didn't have to, I didn't have to take any weird pharmaceutical drugs with crazy side effects. You know, I just, I, that was really, I don't know why that was such an important thing to me. I just stood firm on it. I don't know why I was, yeah. So that was, can't recommend it enough. Powerful man, powerful. And so you're still, still integrating. It's not a, it's not a cure-all, but it's a tool that allowed you to access these emotions and develop the, the knowing and the connection and the awareness of your body and, and these emotions. And so where, where you're at now, because purpose and meaning and, you know, having these experiences of, of connection to the heart space and like, okay, there's something greater out there for me and starting to integrate that. But where are you at currently on this journey and, and where, where are you going from here and how are you building this foundation for kind of who you were and who you want to become? I think I'm not as obsessed with the, what am I doing? Like kind of thing. And I, all I've really done is kind of turned back in to like, wait, what I did, what I used to do was really cool. And I'm an expert. If I'm an expert in one thing, maybe I might be an expert in like spreadsheets now after in my MBA, but I'm, I'm a, an expert in, in training. I'm an expert in, in movement patterns and elite athletes, I think even on the, the emotional side of that. And so for the last six months, I've turned back into, into that life that I had re-engaged, got back into biomechanics, got back into the art of coaching and what that is. And as I was starting to turn back into that, just happened to be in an elevator going up to watch a a Texas football game with a founder of a a local gym here in Austin. And he just, we talked for like more than half the game. It was just like, whoa, and this was really cool. Dude, can I come by and like chat? He's like, yeah, yeah, come by Tuesday. Came in on Tuesday. All right, well, can I meet one of the other founders? Yeah, 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 they'd come by Friday. And then on Friday, they mentioned like, hey, we're, we brought in like one of the best pre-draft guys. He's a track and field guy, actually. You know, he went to LSU. You might, you might have heard of him. I was like, oh yeah, I, I've heard of Mo. And why don't you come, why don't you come back in like a couple of weeks and talk to Mo? He'll be back and talk about the the pre-draft stuff. And maybe there's a, a space for you. Maybe you can help out or something. Just see if it's something you want to do. And I, right five minutes after sitting down in his office, two weeks later, I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. And I started to get that little feeling that you get when you're, when you're laying out like a training plan and you're looking at, oh, okay, US championships are in nine months. Okay, let's lay out the plan. And started to get those feelings again. And didn't, didn't have a lot of pressure. I got nothing to, nothing to prove to anybody. Again, I've got a, a resume in, in the space, you know. Um, I have a reputation and I have kind of, I've earned a, some, a little bit of respect. And so 
this was the best three months from like, you know, January, February, March, 2023 were the best three months of my professional life, you know, since retiring and not making a ton of money, not like winning championships, not doing all that stuff. But I get to work with young men and really, really smart bosses and coaches getting guys ready for the NFL season, ready for the combine, ready for the draft, ready for OTAs, ready, ready for life. Um, we were talking earlier about like the, the NFL combine and all you're setting a record for bench reps and stuff. But that in and of itself, that's a decathlon for football. How, how, how great am I, how well am I prepared to talk to these guys about what it's going to be like to do the, you know, the football equivalent of a decathlon, both like mentally, physically, and emotionally, how that week's going to go, how insane it is. It's a, it's the Olympics for these guys. Um, not saying it's like as important for them, but it's a, the logistics and the red tape and the media and the nonsense that goes in. Oh, and then at the end of it, you have to perform at your best in all these events. I was like, I, oh, this is really what I should have been doing all along. This is awesome. I get to, and the, the, my cup is full every day. I'm on my feet doing demos, coaching, talking. And I have like a really low emotional energy tank, like a low social tank. Like I can only be at parties for so long before I'm like, I just want to go home. Is there a chair I can sit on? Mm -hmm. But I'm coming home and I'm, lighten up with my kids. I'm super pre like it's my cup is full, you know, and I didn't force it. I didn't try. I'm not trying to be the best in the world. I'm just doing my best. And I've turned back to what I know well. And I, that came after the death and the acceptance of the end of that. And it's not ego. It was just the end of this really special thing. And I got to grieve it. And now every day I get to celebrate it, you know, cause at, at the gym, now I walk around and oh, that's, that's Trey. That's he was an Olympic medalist. Listen to what he's got to say, you know? And so now it's, it's like this, it's this integrate, it's integrated now in my, my next life. And it's just been awesome. Like it really has just been awesome. And the last time we were on the podcast, we were talking about the, the company that I was building and now, that got obviously got put on the, put on the back burner for this last crazy year that I've had and full circle. Now that's this new gym is going to be the container for the thing that I was, had been building, you know? Um, I don't even remember what the question was, but that's my, that's my answer to it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's really beautiful, man. You know, the importance of having, you know, like feeling, and accessing these emotions and processing and going into the depth of the grief and the loss of this thing that you're never going to get back instead of running away from it or chasing the next thing to fill the void of it and just accepting it. And then it's really beautiful to, to witness the, the synchronicities and, and being open to, okay, I'm, I'm filling myself up from inside because I'm feeling these emotions and not running away from them. And then how you can start just accepting and listening and being open to the opportunities as they present themselves. And now you're starting to build the foundation for this next path and the importance of having something to work towards, but not something to, to run, a, like you're not with the intention of running away from the thing to fill the void. Mm -hmm. You're full now and you don't need to prove anything. And now you're able to show up and start building and working. I think that's so powerful and important, especially for former athletes that they're listening to this is, you know, access those emotions. Notice when you're, when you're trying to fill that void and a lot of people filling it with drugs, alcohol, like just, just a bunch of distractions. Oh, that's not filling it. That's like avoiding it. Mm, that's numbing out. running, running away from it. That's the, op that's turning your back on them and not facing them, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. And so it's really beautiful, man. I'm really, really proud of you. Uh, really excited for you and really grateful to, to, to be in your life and be on this journey together. I know it's something I'm super passionate about is, is supporting uh, former athletes and creating these spaces for athletes to feel. And I got a couple of things in the works I'm going to be sharing more about, but I got this land 90 minutes outside of town that yeah. we're doing retreats at and definitely plan on, on putting together some experiences for former elite athletes. We're going to do our first one in September and the details are still coming online. 
Um, but yeah, excited to start creating spaces for guys to go into the depths of their emotions and do it within community of people that understand the experience. Cause that's a big piece as, as someone on a top pinnacle, there's not a lot of people that have that experience. Mm -hmm. And so part of the isolation is nobody understands what I'm going through. So even if I go to talk to somebody, even like a therapist or someone professionally trained, it's like, who the fuck are you? Like, you don't know what I'm going through. And so to create a community and a network and an environment where it's elite athletes supporting each other. I just think that's the most powerful medicine possible. And I'm really, really excited about bringing some more of those resources and tools online. Yeah. I mean, it, I can't wait. I can't wait to hear more, more episodes that you do. I mean, it's going to be therapy for me. And it sounds exactly like what I needed, you know, six years ago. Mm. And it, it's, I'm not alone, you know, as you know, that too. Um, and those lessons, I think, translate. I think the 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 roots of the, the the seed that you'll plant with those retreats and stuff, the the impact that it's going to have on on not only just the people that that get to go and experience it, but their families, their friends, and they just get to go off back in their communities and be like the shining light that they were when they were playing. You know, I just think it's awesome. It really, is awesome. Uh, oh man, I deeply appreciate you sharing your story. We covered a lot of ground <laughs> from the top of the mountain, like the most insane experience and all the work you put in to, to the depth of, of wanting to take it all and let it all go. And then being able to find healing within that and now building back up. I'm just, just really grateful for your openness, for your vulnerability, for your story, for who you are. And I feel, I say this all the time, we're just getting started, man. And I'm excited to be on this journey with you. Is there any final words of wisdom for specifically for, for any elite athletes that may be listening to this, uh, that may be struggling with the transition. Cause we're always in transition. We're always going to be integrating this. We're, we're always going to have that, like, man, that feeling I'm never going to have again, no matter what I do, like, it's just, it's just not going to be the same. And so you always, you have to integrate that within yourself. And so is there any words of wisdom for somebody, no matter where they're on their journey that might be facing some of that challenge or haven't been able to fully integrate it yet? Ooh. You know, I think just something that I would have wanted to hear um, and still need to need a reminder of is that shame, shame is something that you put on yourself um, and it's unnecessary and that you're loved and there's nothing shameful about any emotion that you'd ever feel. Those are real. There's no reason to to place those on yourself and the only way out of, of that, that box, the only way out of that, that shame spiral is to face those emotions. And I couldn't do it on my own. I couldn't, I don't know if anybody can really do it on their own. You, you have to talk to somebody that could be a trusted friend. It could be someone on a mental health app. It could be face to face person. It could be with drugs, it could be pharmaceutical, it could be any, anything, you know, going to someone's office, it could be anything, but you have to get help in order to, to learn the tools to process those emotions. And there's no, there's nothing wrong with that. Before I knew how to pole vault, I had to go to a camp and learn how to pole vault. It's an incredibly complex process, but it's nowhere near as complex as what's going on in here and here. Like nowhere near. And and just reach out, reach out to me if you ever need help. Mm. Yeah. Same here. Reach out to me as well. Man, really appreciate you. Where can uh where can people people find you if they want to connect with you or find out what you're working on? Uh usually trying to take a nap if uh I have the time, but, uh, no, I'm at, uh, at Trey Hardy on every social media, not really into TikTok yet, but, um, just at Trey Hardy, just reach out, shoot me a note, DM. Um, it went like all my, my Instagram, it went from like training, competing, training, competing, training, competing. And then it was like six years of just kid picks and like losing followers. Now that I'm back in like the training and, and stuff, uh, setting, there's a little, it's a little cooler now. Um, but yeah, I mean that just reach out. Yeah. I can't, 
overemphasize that enough because that was that was what I needed. I needed that that like lifeline. But yeah, I'm on Instagram and Twitter mainly though. Uh Oh, all that will be in the show notes. And if you enjoyed this episode, make sure you leave a five star review. And if we covered a lot of ground and there's a ton of value and insights and just really good quality, inspiring information in this episode. So if there's someone that you know that you think might get something out of this episode, make sure you share it with them. Uh, I love you all. Really appreciate you joining us and look forward to hearing from you. Peace.